Let me just begin by wishing all the fathers that are in the worship service this morning a happy Father's Day. We pray that this will be a good day for you, that you will be blessed, and that uh, those of you who have children around you, that they will spoil you. But we also acknowledge that for some fathers, uh, days such as this are days that bring sorrow because of various reasons. And so we just want to pray for God's blessing upon all the fathers that are with us this morning. As you might know by now uh, that the theme for this morning's sermon is I am the way, truth, and the life. And that is not pure mind to who's the way, the truth, and the life, but that it is actually Jesus who speaks these words to us. And so we continue with our sermon series where we are looking at the I am sayings of Jesus. And over the past few weeks, we have been journeying together through the book of John, where we have been looking at the different I am sayings that Jesus used to say. Now, I want to begin by just asking you a question. Uh, as you know, that in my next life, I'm going to be a teacher. So it's, it's in my nature to ask questions. And so I want to ask you a question, and it's a very simple question that I want to invite you to spend a few seconds thinking about. If you were to ask God one question, what would you ask God? If you had an opportunity to ask God just one question, and God promises to give you the right answer to your question, what is the one thing that you would ask God? No, but if you do want to share your question, you can share it. <laughs> when is Jesus coming back? That's one question that we all would like to ask so that we get our houses in order. But there is something about questions. Uh, questions are essential to starting conversations. Questions are an everyday uh, part of conversations. Questions serve as invitations to dialogue, and questions always provide an opportunity for further learning. And so this is probably why then questions are at the center of John's Gospel. One of the things in, in John's Gospel is that we find that questions lie right at the center of this gospel. At the beginning of John's story about the life of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus, at the very beginning, Andrew, who later becomes a disciple, poses a question to Jesus. He asks Jesus a question, where are you staying? And then shortly thereafter, a man named Nicodemus inquires from Jesus, how can a grown man climb back into his mother's womb. And then there's the Samaritan woman who also has a conversation with Jesus, and she wants to know how she can get this living water that Jesus talks about at the well. And so the pattern goes on and on throughout the Gospel of John. People such as Peter, Pilate, and all kinds of people all tend to ask Jesus difficult questions. But those difficult questions also become an opportunity for Jesus to reveal something about who he is to them. All these questions that people ask Jesus are questions about some of the things that people struggle with in their life and especially in their faith journey. And so as they pose these questions, to Jesus. They offer Jesus an opportunity to teach them deeply about who he is. In other words, they become starters for Jesus to reveal himself as the way, as the truth, and as the life. However, the questions that are asked in this morning's reading, I think they 
are somehow one of the hardest questions that people have asked Jesus. And before we get to the actual questions, it might be helpful for me to give you a bit of background into this text that we have read this morning. And so we are at a point in John's gospel or in John's telling of the story of the life of Jesus. We are at a point where Jesus is seated with the disciples. It is probably Thursday evening. It is just after Jesus had had his last supper with his disciples. It is on the eve of the crucifixion. And so in John's account, one of the things about Jesus is that he does not only know that he will soon leave this world, but he also tries to prepare his disciples. He tries to prepare them for the events which are about to happen. And so after the Last Supper then that he shares with his friends, Jesus takes some time and he spends the next four chapters of John's Gospel talking about his imminent departure, in other words, preparing them, talking to them about his death. And so these verses come right at the beginning of that long and dramatic scene where Jesus tries to explain to his disciples about his death and what will happen after his death. A few moments earlier before this verse that we have read, Jesus has just told the disciples that one of them will soon betray him. And he has also just said to Peter that Peter will deny him three times. And so it's in this context then that Jesus says, as we have heard in our reading to the disciples, even, all, even though all of these things are going to happen, do not let your hearts be troubled. And at that moment, you can just imagine if you were one of the disciples sitting in this room with Jesus, and Jesus tells you that he is going to die, uh, as if that is not enough, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And when the disciples are still shocked uh, by asking who might it be that would betray Jesus, then Jesus turns to the one that they all look up to for leadership, who is called Peter, and Jesus says to him, you are going to deny me three times. And so you can imagine uh, in all that drama, and then Jesus turns to them. After saying all of those things, those disturbing things, then Jesus turns to them and he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. In other words, everything that I've just said, do not let it worry you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And so you might wonder then how the disciples might have reacted to that. I think the disciples might have asked, what? What are you saying to us? You've just shocked us, and then now you say to us, we should not be troubled, and we should not be shocked. You've just told us that you are going to die. Now, no doubt, most of us can identify with the disciples, and most of us can understand what they might have been going through at that moment in the room as Jesus talks to them. Because you see, I believe that each and every one of us has had such moments too in our lives. When our hearts are deeply, deeply troubled, when our hearts are disturbed, when there are things that concern us, when we go through pain, when we have reason to be troubled, I think we know what it means to be troubled. Looking at the current economic situation in our country, most of us are troubled by our finances. And so we all know what it feels like to be troubled. And so we can identify with the disciples, as Jesus said to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. But Jesus does not stop there. He says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. But he invites them 
into something else. He invites them to take their troubled lives and commit them to him. He invites them to trust him with their troubles, even though he has just told them that he's going to die. Then, before you know it, he moves on and he talks about going away. And then, as he talks about going away, he also talks about preparing places for them and coming back for them. Now, when, when Jesus talks about preparing places for us, that is talk about the kingdom of God. That is talk about heaven. That is talk about Jesus taking us to a place where we really, really, really do not need to be worried and to be troubled. Whilst they were still shocked about that, then Jesus continues. He implies that they should know what is it that he's talking about when he's talking about going to some place to prepare something for them? And he says to them, they should actually know what is it that he's talking about. As if that is not enough. Now, this is very confusing. As if that is not enough. He then goes on to say, they should also know how to follow him. In other ways, they should know how to get to that place where Jesus is going to prepare for them. And it is at this moment where one of, the, of my favorite disciples by the name of Thomas, at this moment of confusion, then Thomas just bursts in and he poses one of those difficult questions that we find in the Gospel of John. And Thomas says to Jesus, but Jesus, actually, we do not even know where you are going. So don't talk to us as if we know, because we actually don't even know where you are going. How then can we know the way? If we don't know where you are going, how then can we know the way? And when Jesus then says he is the way, Jesus responds to them and he says to, to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when Jesus says that and he asks again that they trust him, then another disciple now gets into the picture. His name is Philip. Philip could not hold himself but to ask another difficult question to Jesus. But Philip's question is not really a question at face value. It sounds more like a statement. It sounds more like a request. It could even qualify to be a plea. But I also think it might also be a demand from him. But underneath all, it is actually a question. And this is what Philip says. He says to Jesus, show us the Father. Show us the Father. Can you imagine asking Jesus to show God, to show us who God is? Philip says, show us the Father, and then we will be satisfied. In other words, Philip is saying to Jesus, the only way for us to know the way and to know how to follow the way, you need to show us what does God look like. Show us the Father. He doesn't say, tell us who the Father is, but he says, show us the Father. In other words, we have heard so much about the Father. We've been taught so much about the Father. What we want now is a real life experience of who the Father is. And so Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father. In other words, what does God look like? In the midst of our troubles, in the midst of everything that is troubling us, this is what Philip is actually saying. When so much is going so wrong in our lives, what does God look like? 
if God is so good, why are so many people unemployed? If God is so good, why are so many people suffering from sickness and illness? Show us the Father. What does God look like? In the midst of everything that you are telling us, and in the midst of everything that is happening even in our own lives, what does God actually look like? Now, this is a very brave question, but again, I suspect that you and I can understand where it comes from. Because again, each and every one of us have been there too. At our lowest points, desperate for some hope that things will get better. Hoping and waiting for some reason to believe that this tragedy that we're going through in our life is not all there is to our life. Maybe it was when the doctor told you that the cancer had returned. Or maybe when a loved one suddenly died, like in my case a few months ago, a loved one just suddenly died and we were not expecting it. Or maybe it was when you discovered that suddenly we are going to be retrenched from work. And the list can really go on. We all know these struggles that make us question what does God look like. Each of us, you see, has also had some moments where we wanted some reassurance, some glimmer of hope that all that we had yet and learned about God is not just some false story, but that it is true. Just show us the Father we have also pleaded in our prayer life to God to show up. At the lowest points of our lives, we have prayed and said to God, God, if you are there somewhere, can you please just show up and we will be satisfied. And so, we have also, like Philip, said to Jesus, just show us the Father and we will be satisfied. To which then Jesus responds, not in frustration, but Jesus responds in love. Because we remember in the Gospel of John, all these questions help Jesus to reveal some greater truth about who Jesus is and some greater truth about the love of God. And so Jesus responds in love to both Philip, but also to us. And this is what Jesus says to Philip. Have I been with you all this time, and yet still you do not know me? Because whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Knowing Jesus, then, is knowing the way. Knowing Jesus, then, is knowing the truth. Knowing Jesus, then, is knowing the life. Because Jesus is the embodiment of this truth, that God is salvation. And so Jesus came to live out that truth and to provide a way for us to experience it. Jesus provides a way for us to experience God in real terms. And that way is a way of grace and truth, which is not just limited to our ability to explain or to even understand it. And so all that is needed from us is to accept Jesus Christ as our way. Now, when we accept Jesus as our way, one of the things that we do is that we accept him as our pattern of life. In other words, the way in which we live, we take our pattern from how Jesus lived. How then do we do this? How do we begin to give this thing meaning and life for us? How can we live knowing that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, and that Jesus is the life. I think it might be good for us to look at the disciples, the people who actually lived with Jesus. And so I want to suggest a few things that 
we get as we look at the disciples, how they themselves made Jesus the way, the truth, and life in their own lives. And so the first thing that the disciples did was that they did so by being connected with Jesus in a small community. They were connected with Jesus in a small community. And so for three years, the disciples lived with Jesus in a small group of about 12, and Jesus would probably have been the 13th person. And what they did as they met in that group is that they were doing life together, and they were experiencing Jesus together. The disciples were wrestling with who Jesus is together within that small group, that small community. These disciples then realized that knowing Jesus was not just limited to individual experiences. They understood this important thing, that faith can become an abstract until it becomes real, until it is experienced, until it is also experienced in relation with other people who are on the same journey. And so the disciples came to understand who Jesus was and what he could do through the fellowship with other Christians with whom they entrusted their lives. This is why here at Westview, one of the things that we encourage all of us to do is that we encourage all of us to belong in a small group of some sort, whether it is a home group, whether it is a Bible study group, or whether it is one of those other groups such as the Women's Auxiliary or the Men Network, because there is something important that happens when we are connected with Jesus in a small group. And so the disciples spent three years being connected with Jesus in a small group. The second thing that they did was that they did so by practicing spiritual disciplines. They practiced spiritual disciplines. And so the disciples had to learn the importance of developing practices that deepened their connection with God. One of the very early requests that the disciples made to Jesus was asking Jesus to teach them to pray. They went to Jesus very early and said to Jesus, teach us to pray. As they observed Jesus' way of life, you remember that Jesus used to leave them and go and pray. As they observed Jesus' way of life, they saw something in his prayer life that they wanted. And so they went to him and said to him, teach us to pray. And so living in the Jesus way also means developing habits that bring us closer to God, habits that make God real to us. Such habits include, but they're not limited, to things such as prayer, Bible study, meditation, journaling, fasting, and other spiritual practices that make God real to us. The third thing that we learn from the disciples is that they did so by practicing sacrifice. And so living the Jesus way also means practicing sacrifice. Following Jesus is following a savior who laid down his life so that we may have life. And so the disciples themselves experienced the cross in some ways from a distant from a distance but in some ways also from within a very close proximity somehow the cross opened their eyes to the fact that new life and hope can only come through sacrifice as they watched Jesus they realized that new life and hope can only come through sacrifice now, this profoundly changed the disciples. They all made sacrifices for what they believed. Even when Jesus had ascended and was no longer within them, they continued the work that Jesus had started through sacrifice. 
yet they also experience profound joy in sacrificing. And then the last thing that the disciples did was by showing compassion. The disciples learned from Jesus' way to show compassion to all people. And so for them, making Jesus their way meant that they had to release some of their prejudices. And therefore, they reached out to people that they would otherwise have avoided. This also meant noticing people that they were able to help. Following Jesus made them aware of how Jesus noticed those who are overlooked by society. And so when you make Jesus your way, this is what happens. You will become open to Jesus pointing out opportunities to extend grace to other people. Understanding that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life then calls us to make Jesus our way and not just to think of Jesus as a way. It calls us to let Jesus to become our way and to define how we live our lives, define what we do with our lives. I believe that when we do this, then our faith becomes something more than what we just believe. It becomes something that we live out daily. When we do this, God becomes real as Jesus lives in us. I think one of the two boys said that Jesus lives in us. And so when we make Jesus our way, Jesus then is able to live in us. And when Jesus lives in us, we in turn become people who show other people what the Father looks like. When Jesus lives in us, other people can look at us and they can know what God looks like. People can look at us and they can get a real experience of what the Father looks like. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life, Jesus also invites those who are his disciples to partake in becoming the way, the truth, and the life in this world. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for Jesus. We thank you that in Jesus you, you came down to our level, that in Jesus you were able to show us who you are, we thank you that as we study the life of Jesus, as we begin to understand Jesus as the way, Jesus as the truth, and Jesus as life, we begin to know that you, our God, are the way, the truth, and life. We thank you that in Jesus we can see your face, that in Jesus we can experience what you look like. But we also thank you that when we say yes to the love that you show us in Jesus, that when you invite us into relationship with you, we thank you that our response also comes with the call to become places or people where other people can see what you look like when they look at us. And so, God, we pray for those amongst us who are going through a phase in their lives where they desperately need to see your face. And we pray that you will reveal yourself to them. We pray for those of us who, at this stage in our lives, we need to be your face to other people. And we pray, Lord, that you will enable us to represent you so that when other people encounter us, they might also encounter you that when they see us, they might get a sense of what the Father looks like. And as we are now going to share in the Lord's Supper, we pray, Lord, that you use this moment to communicate your grace to us, that where we need to get an assurance of your presence, that you use this meal to communicate that assurance to us. 
We pray for all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.